think I was a bit more hopeful actually. And that was even even understanding the challenges and kind of understanding thermodynamics a bit a bit better because I think that's really important. You know, so it's it's going to be tough and it's going to be difficult. There's there's no silver bullets here. We're going from very dense sources of energy, like you know, like oil, to things which are much less dense, like you know, wind power, and putting it into batteries, or putting it into hydrogen. You know, it's much more inefficient. At the time when people thought we would never have solid state semiconductors, so basically silicon chips. But hopefully, in this transition, we can be more open-eyed to what we last. Ed Conway, it's a thrill to talk to you, to see you, um, and indeed to, to listen to you, because I've been doing that for hours and hours, listening on Audible to your book, uh, Material World. So uh, nice to meet you. How are you? Yeah, no, I'm good, thank you. I'm excited about kind of telling this. I've been sitting on a lot of these little stories for, for three years, really. And I, as a journalist, you're not used to sitting on stuff. So finally, I get to kind of splurge about it. But in a way, the problem is that there's so much in there. Um, because it's just not because of you know any brilliance on my end, more just because it's such a fascinating different set of things to talk about, and so I kind of just feel like I want to talk about it all the time. And you know, <laughs> it's not just trying to sell my book. I think this stuff is really important. Well, no, I, on that point, um, this isn't going to be a book review. There are plenty of people who are far more um, competent at that sort of work than that. But I do agree with you. I think it's a really important book. Why? Because I think it, it starts to put into the public domain a narrative around let's understand how the world works. I'm going to read something that, that you wrote, I think, in something else. The inconvenient truth about climate change is that solving it will involve digging, blasting and leaching more minerals from the skin of this planet than ever before. No one much likes to talk about this, but talk about it we must. So can you can you just give a little bit more of an explanation of that that, that I've just read out, your, your words? Yeah. Why must we talk it's about not, it? It's not to say we shouldn't do it at all it's more just to say we already do this that's the point because we don't spend much time like thinking about how the world actually works you know there, there are plenty of people who do and i think there's a wellspring of, of curiosity about this stuff but because in you know the mainstream we don't talk that much just about the practicalities of how we make stuff and get stuff and get it out of the ground we don't talk about the fact that we are still massively reliant on things that we pluck out of the ground for basically everything we kind of think that we live in this in this ethereal universe where the only thing that matters is kind of brain power and of course brain power is incredibly important to you know our, our ability to come up with ideas is massively important and transformative and part of who we are as human beings but we do that brain power and we we make tools and a lot of those tools are still physical tools you know whether it's from the iron that we get out of the ground, the copper that goes into wiring, the sand that then goes into glass, uh, or indeed into concrete and all of these other things, we are still reliant on the inherent physicality of the, of the world. And the fact, I think, that we don't do as much of that at the moment in developed economies, particularly, you know, we've outsourced a lot of that stuff, particularly in the UK, particularly in Europe, to a slightly lesser extent, but still to a, to a great extent in the US, because it happens out of sight, I feel like, and because there are so few people working within those worlds at the moment, getting stuff out of the ground, converting it into useful products. So, you know, mining, engineering, manufacturing, all of that stuff, because that's a comparatively smaller part of the workforce these days. And a lot of those people, you know, are humble people who keep to themselves to themselves. They're not out to try and, you know, tell themselves. They're not out to try and get into politics for the most part, because the world of policy media is dominated by people who have no connection with the, that other universe when it comes to making stuff that material world i'm going on about i just feel like we don't talk about it enough so the starting point for you know in a way for, for what you were quoting which was kind of a column i wrote while i was researching this is that if we're not honest about what we do right now and what we rely on right now which includes loads of mining far, far more mining than we've ever done before, not just for fossil fuels, by the way, fossil fuels is one segment of it. Um, but if we're not honest about how we actually get the world we're reliant on now, then how are we going to be honest about 
the world that we want to have in the future hmm. you know and and that's hmm. and that's part of the the kind of the uncomfortable truth of, of 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 what we're going through right now no one you know very few people disagree that we we need to try and clean things up but if we're going to clean things up we need to be honest about where we're starting from and where we're going to get to and how we can do it most pragmatically that's that's well, the important thing right well, well well on that point what i see as an electric vehicle advocate or a clean technology advocate or whatever people would like to think i am or i think of myself is that it's only now when we're, we're needing lithium, when we're needing cobalt, graphite, when we're needing manganese, does it seem that there's a negative narrative towards mining? Whereas, as you rightly say, we've been doing it, well, literally for centuries, you know, for all mankind doing, almost. Yeah. So We've been doing it forever. Yeah. yeah so why is it that only now are, are we getting these um, revelations, if you like, come to the fore? And they're always... They're always, you know, part of a negative narrative rather than a realistic one saying, well, look, if you want to have turbine, um, turbines, if you want to have solar panels, if you want to have EVs, where do you think this stuff comes from? Yeah. What, what, well, what's what's driving that, do you think? I think, I think, you know, I think for a lot of people, um, they see what we're going through right now and they, they feel unnerved by it and nervous about it and a lot of people are looking and saying well maybe it's not quite as straightforward as we have been told it was going to be and I think that's true I think I think you know a lot of the way that this has been depicted by politicians and to some extent by campaigners is that it was going to be easy and it was going to be completely win-win but the reality is anyone who's actually working within these sectors understands is that you know engineering stuff is tough it's complicated and going, you know, there, there's thermodynamics that we're, we're, we're pushing up against here because we're going from very dense sources of energy like, you know, like oil to things which are much less dense, like getting wind power and putting it into batteries or putting it into hydrogen. You know, that's much more inefficient. So there are all kind of some some hard realities of how difficult this is going to be. And I think for a lot of people, when they see that, when they see the fact that it involves lots more mining, things like lithium, things like cobalt, they look at it and they say, aha, look, it wasn't going to be so easy. You know, you told us it was going to be easy, not going to be easy. But I don't think that's a reason not to be doing that, this stuff. It's just a reason to be honest about the challenges we're facing. And let's try and do it in a way that is more sustainable this time around. Because I think that's the thing. We've been mining for, you know, millennia. We've been getting copper out of the ground for millennia. We are, but because we've been doing it for so long, it's like people don't really think that much about the destruction and the dirtiness of what we've been doing in the past when it comes to that stuff. Um, but what we are doing now in the future is we're having to mine a suite of different metals. You know, we're having to mine so much more nickel than we have, ha ever have done before. We're having to go for far more lithium. You know, lithium was never really mined in industrial quantities. We're having to do that for the first time. So. The fact that this, there's a novelty to it, I think, makes some people think, well, hang on, this is dirty. Why are we doing it? But the reality that I hope is depicted in, in the book is to say this is a continuation of something we have been doing forever. The difference this time around is I think we are a bit more cognizant of the kind of, you know, the implications and the externalities, as economists, economists would call them, the, um, the dirtiness that we can cause. So hopefully... In this transition, we can be more open eyed to, to all that stuff, because frankly, we didn't think about that stuff as much in the Industrial Revolution in the past, not because of, you know, any malice. It just wasn't the science wasn't there. But, yeah. You know, it's, it's so I think I think it, it, it's a combination of being genuinely excited about the moment we're in at the moment, because the challenges are great. And where there are great challenges, there are great opportunities. But I think the reality is a lot of people are looking at this and they're saying, hang on, no one told us it was going to be so difficult, so expensive, all of that stuff. Yeah, you're, you're so right. And, and I, I, I'm wondering, at any time in the past, you know, civilizations, either ancient or, or modern, have has the population been aware, big cognizant, your, your, your word, of the reality of, you know, how, how they live, where that we're either digging it up or we're growing it, mm. you know, those two very simplistic aspects of where yeah. everything comes from. Has there been a time when cultures or societies have been aware of that? I mean, we live in the modern age of mass communication. Seemingly, you can know anything anywhere at the touch of a button. But in, in ironically, do, do we know less now as a society than perhaps people knew in the past? I, th I think we know much less. I think we know much less. And again, it's not through any fault of anyone. It's because so few people are working within the sectors that get stuff out of the ground and bring it to us. So, you know, in agriculture, 
uh, it used to be that uh, basically half of the population, sometimes more, about uh, over just over a century ago in the US, it was basically half the population worked in agriculture. Now it's just about one and a bit percent. So that was go from an area where everyone understood what it meant to get stuff out of the ground, to find fertilizer, to, to plow fields, to use steel, to, to actually turn what we have in the earth into something that we can consume. Same thing for manufacturing. There was a far greater proportion of people who used to work in manufacturing. There was a far greater proportion of people who used to work in mining. It is a wonderful thing, frankly, that there are nowadays so few people working in those sectors because it was tough work. It was incredibly yeah. tough work. And it was dangerous as well in mining and in manufacturing as well. And it still is in, 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 in those sectors. Um, so it's great that there's so few people working in there. It's great that we, you know, I, I inhabit this other ethereal world. Um, however, the fact I think that we're, yeah, I think we have gone to an era where we understand less about it and therefore just are a bit less realistic about the realities of this place. And so to some extent, this, you know, this journey I've been on in the book, there's nothing new in there, but the fact, the merest fact that for a lot of people, when they read it, they'll be like, blimey, I didn't realize this and I didn't realize that just shows, I think, how much relearning we could do if we're going to kind of try and be more in tune with, you know, the, the, the humanity of this world we inhabit. And that humanity is we, we get stuff out of the ground. We make tools. We use them to make the world a better place. We're just carrying on doing them right now. But sometimes getting those tools out of the ground is a little bit mucky. Hmm. Oh, very mucky in some situations. Some of the graphic illustrations that you, you, you talk about in the book um, were, were really eye popping uh, to me. And I thought I knew quite a lot. I mean, I probably know more than a lot of people simply yeah. because my focus has come through Simon Moores and the Benchmark Mineral team who analyze a lot of this stuff, the data. You know, I've got to meet with and know people in, involved in mining, mineral processing you know, the geopolitics of it all, got my head around all of that. So a lot of what you were writing for me resonated very strongly. But I'm thinking of the people that really don't know anything about this. I mean, your point's a really good one about how, yes, we were more connected in the past because that was what so many people did. That's what we did. But they, yeah, but they don't know, hadn't really thought of it in that way. It's a very good point. But how in the modern world then do we, given climate change, arguably, well, of course it is the most significant interest, uh, issue of the day, and, 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 and the future. How do we weave this into the, the conversation so that it's not just picked up as a negative, oh, well, I told you, you know, EVs were a bad idea, or I told you all this renewable energy was rubbish. You know, how do we get an intelligent discussion? Um, and the warts and all of it, not, not let's okay. not sanitize any of it. It's such, I mean, it's such a good question. And I spend a lot of time thinking about this to some extent agonizing over it because I'm aware that that some of the stuff in this book, because it, it enumerates some of the challenges, people will look at it and will say, oh gosh, well, it's just too hard. You know, why are we doing this? It's going to yes. be too expensive. It's going to make life too difficult for the next few decades. And what I've said in kind of, you know, in comparison to that is that it will also be exciting, that there will also be opportunities for us to live, you know, more frugally without it feeling like, like a sacrifice. But I, I think if we're not honest about this stuff, we're going to just hit against much more in the way of resistance. I think that's the thing. If you're not honest and if you're deluding people and yourself about both, both the, the nature of what we're facing. So a lot of, for a lot of people, they want to depict the, the realities of climate change as something that is literally apocalyptic. Okay, so that's, that is also a form of delusion. Um, it is not apocalyptic. It is very bad in many senses, but calling it, you know, absolutely the end of world is 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 just doesn't seem to accord with any of the any of the science according to the you know the IPCC and so on. So there's that side of delusion. But then saying that you know we that this is too difficult, that this is impossible, is also a form of delusion because there there is a path through this. It's just a difficult path, and if we're not honest to people about the fact that it's tough and also exciting then I think you're just going to lose more and more people as it goes on and as the realities of that start, start to hit. Because, you know, it's going to be kind of expensive. It's expensive to build this stuff. We're going from an era where it was cheap to get oil out of the ground. It was cheap and incredibly energy dense. And it was efficient. And that oil also had this suite of other uses like plastics, which, which I know, you know, for all the downsides of plastics, there have been an incredible amount of upsides as well in terms of the sanitation and, and what they've brought to much of the world. 
So, and, 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 and fertilizer, you know, natural gas, where, where does fertilizer come from? It comes from natural gas. When you, <laughs> when you consume basically anything these days, directly or indirectly, apart from a very small fragment, you will be consuming a form of natural gas. And so understanding that is a, is, is a helpful start to this because then it just means that we, I, I just don't, I think we need to go into this with our eyes open. And part of the book is it wasn't intended to be a book like this. It was just intended to be a book that was answering some, satisfying my curiosity about how the world actually kind of happens. But yeah, you just then end up going down these wormholes that are totally fascinating, which also have some resonance for, for where we are right now politically. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And something that I've used as analogy, I'm, I'm keen on analogies to help me try and understand things because I'm not... You know, I've got a reasonable mind, but I'm not an intellectual, I'm not an academic, um, is, is the Rubik's Cube. If you look at what a Rubik's Cube is, you know, um, look at its facets, look at the different colours, look at what the objective is, is to match them all up. Where we are as humanity, you could argue, is a bit like a Rubik's Cube. Every time we move one bit, something else moves. Mm, you know, the, the, yeah. the, 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 the ex, what do you call them, externalities, all, all of those things yeah, exactly. are, are manifest in that. And I recently heard Mr. Rubik's talking about the origin of, of what, why he made it. And he, was, he had students, he was teaching people. And he said, I wanted people to look at something, really look at something and think, what are you actually seeing? What do you see? And, and his concept around that was to give people a puzzle, a challenge that was seemingly impossible. Um, uh, but but the, the idea, the objective w was to get people to think about what they were looking at before they tried to solve it. And in mm. the same way to solve the Rubik's Cube is, you know, there are a relatively small number of moves compared to the trillions if you just don't know the algorithm. If you know the algorithm, you can do it. Um, so I, I feel... Almost climate change, you know, tackling geopolitics, where we are with food, population growth, all these things are like little squares on the Rubik's Cube. And we have to kind of not just willy nilly twist them all around. We have to discover some kind mm. of algorithm to actually get the puzzle solved. That, that's one thing. Yeah. Second thing, picking up on what you've just said um, about choices, education, the reality, the cost of things. The chapter you come to in your book about deep sea mining. I think anyone, any human being on the planet then gets very troubled by the thought of this happening, you know, one way or the other. Whether it's ever going to be economically feasible or not, that seems to be the big issue to my, to my mind, apart from the environmental issue. Surely, um, Ed, we're at a point where unless we confront the challenge of terrestrial mining and what does that mean for all of the stuff that currently happens on land, understand that better help communities deal with that better, get the mining companies to be fairer in the rewards, you know, the, the, the benefits that they get from this, we will, by accident, default, whatever, end up going into the deep oceans simply because we're not using what's, what's on land. Is that a scenario you imagine? I, I think that's the really that's that's the important point is to think about what we're doing on the ground on, you know, terrestrial mining, you know, as well as what the potential kind of both damage and opportunities are going to be going under the sea, because this is the difficulty there. Are, it's terrifying. You know, I find it terrifying, the idea of going down there. What do we know about human experience? We know when we go into, you know, uncharted territories with pristine ecosystems, with our tools, we end up ruining them or damaging them. And it sometimes takes quite a long time for them to recover. So just the idea of knowingly going into a new ecosystem that we know is pretty much pristine, um, and doing what we want to do to it, it's it, it it's 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 unnerving and it's 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 not happy making certainly. The thing though is that again we need to be honest about what we're doing at the moment in terrestrial mining. It's like yeah. we kind of we blind ourselves to that because we've been doing it for years. But Benchmark Mineral Intelligence had a great thing on on what's going on in Indonesia with nickel mining. You know, some of it yes. is very uh, ecologically sound, but some of it, you know. They are tipping the tailings, toxic waste, into the sea. They mm. are killing sea life in richer ecosystems, you know, because they're, they're, they're generally speaking, shoreline, shallow lying ecosystem, uh, marine ecosystems are, have far more in the way of life than the yeah. stuff in the deep ocean. So we are currently killing more marine life through mining on the land than we probably would on the basis, I should say, on the basis of what we know. And there is probably so much we don't know more that which outnumbers what we do know. But we are killing so much marine ecosystems right now in the way that we're mining on the land. And so we need to deal with that as well. And, and I know that, you know, uh, 
both neither of these things are especially desirable but we need to be honest about what we're doing at the moment and we also need to be honest about the fact that if we're going to get to net zero we need a lot more nickel we need a lot more of these other minerals uh, we need a lot more lithium as well and that stuff is not just going to materialize out of thin air you know we don't even have enough of the stock of nickel or indeed lithium in the world to be able to recycle even if we had 100 percent recycling rates which we don't so we yeah. need to get it from somewhere we need to improve the way that we're mining it but that also will mean potentially making it more expensive which in turn means making batteries more expensive and there is no kind of easy route out of this um and so the 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 areas that I find are most the most fascinating are the areas where they are deeply discomforting. You know, it's like all, all, a lot of this book that I've written, I was very uncomfortable writing it. I think it's going to be slightly uncomfortable reading it, but there's also enough kind of wonder, I think, in there to, 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 to you know, to compensate for that. But that's the nature of the world. It's grey areas. There are no heroes and villains in there, you know. There are there are people who are kind of following their ec economic kind of incentives, um, and for the most part, the world becomes a better place as we go on. I mean, like one one analogy is coal. I mean, no, coal is obviously that no one can say anything good about coal these days. But the very beginning of the, our coal story in the UK, it started here in the UK. What was that to do? It was to address an ecological catastrophe, which is that we were chopping down too many trees. We yeah. were literally deforesting and running out of trees in the UK. And the advent of coal arguably saved the forests in the UK. It saved them, you know? Obviously, it then caused its own long tail catastrophe. And the same thing with oil. You know, people were worried about various kind of ecological catastrophes before oil came along with whale populations running out. You know, they were worried that the, 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 the streets in London and New York would get filled with horse manure and oil came along and solved that. It solved kind of ivory, people going and getting ivory to, to make into billiard balls. Well, oil came along and we made plastics out of this and various other kind of things out of cellulose and so on and so forth. And now you have snooker balls and things that are made out of, out of those kind of polymers. So... The things that seem like they are saving us do often later on turn out to have their own sting in the tail. And it's very possible that the same will be the case with what we're doing right now. But each step in the way, <laughs> along the way, um, we just have to learn as we go. That seems to be the way that we do these things. Well, well it's the story of humanity, isn't it? Trial and error, I suppose. But what I like about the book so much is that you haven't just cut and pasted stuff from other people. You've gone around the world. I mean, I really take my hat off to you um, in that, you know, when you're talking about what goes on in South America, you went to South America. When you talk about lots of places in the book, you were there. So I've got a couple of quick questions, really, just on that particular aspect. N number one, did you film that stuff? And are you going to make a documentary out of this? Because I definitely, I definitely want to watch it. <laughs> Uh, well, watch this space because I, 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 I'd like to do more on this. We did, we actually did. So when I was, I went out to Chile for one bit of it, and I, and I said to Sky, I'm going out there. We should definitely film some of this stuff. It's, it will look amazing. And we did film a little thing out there. So there's, a, there's a bit that's actually, if you go online, uh, you can find it um, of some of the copper and some of the, the lithium. But that's the thing about this. You know, I'm, I'm a visual journalist as well as a written journalist, and, and this is all very tangible visible stuff you know some of it's pretty shocking but some of it's amazing but you can see and touch this world that we are building right now it's very exciting um and so yeah i mean watch this space hopefully there'll be more to come uh visually as well in the in the meantime you know you can buy the book if you want to uh oh, oh, oh. You know, just putting that out there <laughs> <laughs> Look, like I said, I'm not your book agent. Um, I'm not a reviewer, <laughs> but I've been around enough to understand where storytelling, and that's what I hope I'm good at, that's what I do, and contextualizing, joining up, you know, the proverbial dots and helping people understand, you know, cause and effect. Um, and yeah, champion electric vehicles, but I don't blindly do that. I understand, you know, that the managed transition is, is an epic challenge for the manufacturers. It, it feeds into geopolitics in terms of the lead that China particularly, you know, has got in all this. All of this threads through the book. So, you know, I, I'm, 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 I'm very familiar with it. Um, but can, can I ask you this? When you and I don't want to quote passages from the book because I want people to read it or, or, or listen to it. But when you get to the conclusion, when you've seen all of these things, 
you know, you're an economics editor. You know that the reality of the world is anchored in money, is anchored in profit and loss, is anchored in GDP. You know that better than most because that's that's your arena. I, once you got to the end of this journey, if I can put it like that, all of the visits, all the research and you'd finished the book, were you more or less hopeful for the future? I think I was a bit more hopeful, actually. And that was even even understanding the challenges and kind of understanding thermodynamics a bit a bit better because <laughs> I think that's really important. You know, it's 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 going to be tough and it's going to be difficult. There's there's no silver bullets here. Well, unless we can work out fusion, but I mean, it doesn't look like nuclear fusion is going to be there, you know, anytime soon. And it will also probably be quite resource intensive because you need to get various things like lithium and deuterium and all of this. Anyway, um, I was quite hopeful because. This is not the first time in history that a lot of people have looked at our plight and said, this is going to be too difficult. We're not going to be able to engineer our way out. The challenge is too great. There have been so many moments like that in history, and some of them are described in the book. You know, there were, there were, there were moments at the turn of the 20th century when people were worried we were going to run out of fertilizer and the world was going to starve because we were running out of mined fertilizer. We used to mine nitrogen fertilizer out of the ground in, in South America as well. And we were starting to run out. And then they invented a way of getting that out of the air, the Harbour Bosch process, one of the most important innovations in the world. There was a time when people thought that we would never be able to rediscover the Roman recipe for concrete. You know, we lost the recipe for how to make it's cement crazy, and concrete. Isn't it? Yeah, that's it's crazy. crazy. And then it was yeah. rediscovered. There was, there was time when people thought we'd never be able to make special chemicals like soda ash and so on from salt. We, they worked out how to do it. There was a challenge that the King of France at the time, just before the revolution did, and people worked out how to do it. There was a time when people thought we would never have solid state semiconductors, so basically silicon chips, because at the time it was just valves. The idea of making a silicon chip, or, or at the time it was germanium, uh, looked really difficult. So this is not, and I, there, are men, there are more listed in the book. This is not the first time where the challenges, there have been naysayers and there have been doubters, and the challenges have genuinely looked incredibly difficult. And that, that fills me with hope because this is a moment. We are living through a moment, yes, it's going to be tough, where we are shifting from this you know, carbon intensive world to one with, you know, where we are much less carbon intensive. That's going to be really difficult, but it involves so many of those little discrete challenges, like the stuff I've just mentioned, that I don't know, that could be really exciting. People are going to invent stuff at the moment. This, I feel like we've been crying out. You, you, know, you mentioned I'm an economics uh, kind of uh, reporter. We're, we're stuck in what economists like to call secular stagnation. We've had a long period where productivity has just been really low and disappointing, particularly here in the, the developed world. Suddenly, all of a sudden, along comes this biggest industrial challenge that we have had in our lifetimes, possibly in humanity, possibly in humanity because of the scale of what we're trying to do. That strikes me as an enormous, enormous industrial opportunity for all of us to be living through. And so, yeah, I, I ended feeling on balance more excited than more depressed, even though there's, there's depressing and difficult stuff in there, um, that what we're living through now could also be incredible. Yeah, no, well, optimistic realism, that, that, that's a great thing to have. And you nicely put, and I, I've used this myself quite a few times, plenty of people have cornucopian or malthusian do you believe in you know the ability of mankind to 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 tackle these things uh, and uh, yeah i do as well so I, I i'm with you as opposed to malthusian where we're all going to go to what's the phrase hell in a handcart um yeah. so yeah, ho hopefully not and, and another little add to that a book i read a few years ago called green swans the coming boom in regenerative capitalism by john elkington that is a that is a book of uh, realistic optimism as well, um, gi giving giving some good narrative to where the you know the economic drivers, the drivers of wealth, the drivers of profit um, are not dirty words. They're not bad things. Mm. They are in a small letter socialist. They develop humanity. They progress solutions, etc. Et mm. Can we just finish on a, a bit more closer to home? I, I mean, I'm lucky to have a global audience uh, and, and I know what you do is, is a global perspective. But um, just recently, um, between Tata and the government, there's an announcement, finally, of a gigafactory here. I don't want to talk about the politic dynamics to, to, to political dynamics to all of that. But just we're going to build a big gigafactory. 
we've already got you know AESC you know this landscape very well because another thing you did I liked was when you were talking about graphite the graphite processing the graphite opportunity in the UK you did a lovely film about that in the northeast of England so the irony is the UK has got a lot of natural resource a lot of industrial capability I think you cited it either in the book or in that that piece uh, camera uh, film you, you made mm. you know we've got one of the most um uh confident strident well experienced um chemical industry in the world and and a, mm. and a battery is an electrochemical device so we've got many of the ingredients now. What's your sense of what's going to happen here in the UK in regard to trying to catch up with Europe? China's way out in front. Um, again, are you an optimist or, or maybe a pessimist in terms of how can the UK now be part of this new world, uh, particularly batteries? Yeah, yeah I've, been, I've been quite pessimistic for, for, for the last year or two just because it struck me that there were opportunities, very big opportunities in the UK, you know, not, not in every bit of the battery. And again, as your, your, your following will, will understand how complex this is. It's not just about gigafactories. It's also about that other suite of the supply chain up until there. So like Absolutely. you were saying, chemi chemicals and, and, you know, separators and anodes and cathodes and all of that stuff, not to mention the, the, the minerals and the other bits and pieces. So it, you know, the UK had had not a bad position in that. You know, we had, I think, one of the only places in Europe that was capable of making the electrolyte solution that you needed inside those batteries. That's a place up in Billingham. Um, there, as I mentioned, there's the anode side of things. We we were making the the majority of Europe's graphite coke that then gets turned into the the the, the graphite goes it going inside those anodes, albeit in China. So it gets made in the north in Humberside, shipped off to the Crazy. north uh, to, from the north. Sea. I know it is. It is very ironic because why? Because that's a very energy intensive, carbon intensive process. And we just don't like carbon intensive processes in this country. Yeah. So unless but, it's but, been there for ages. But but on that point, my learning, my journey over the last only few years with Simon Moores and the crew and all of that mining kind of thing, uh, I discovered there's a company called Urbix. I mean, full declaration. I kind of invested in it, in them and, and went on their board. They process graphite, a little, little company called Urbix in mm. Phoenix, Arizona. They can process graphite without the, the processes of uh, hydrochloric, hydrofluoric acids, they can do it mm. in, in industrial proximity to gigafactories, etc. You know, I'm, I'm not trying to pitch them to everybody. I'm just saying to your point earlier yeah. about, about progress, about invention, about making it better, that's happening. I was recently in Serbia. There are two big resources of lithiums and, and also one of them is borates as well, borax. Um, mm. And the process that they're looking to mine those is by by tunneling and taking the tailings and putting them in the old coal mines and actually making the place look better than, than, than mm. when they started. Now, you know, obviously they've got to deliver on that promise. That's the objective. That's the plan. But even there, going back to this difference between the oceans and the land, Serbia had a bit... The Yadar. Yeah, well, Yadar is, is the Rio Tinto um, the proposition. Yeah. That has had a big kickback on it from yeah, yeah. political Probably kickback and, and from the population because of the way in which it was presented and some of the aspects of what they were doing. But, but all of that, exactly as you've been saying in this conversation, are, are things that, that we, we've, we've got to get better at. We can't just sort of run roughshod over things. We can't speed up the licensing process. We can't do all these things that take a long time and do them quicker simply by saying, oh, we don't care about anything anymore. Let's just do it anyway. Um, th th that's not what we mean and that's not what can happen. But I, 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 am, I am encouraged, very encouraged by the final late announcement of the Gigafactory. I hope it becomes a magnet for many other things. I, I think that's the thing. It's about the rest of the get it. If that can be a kind of getting get the rest of the supply chain coming, because at the moment we don't have anything when it comes to cathode active materials. No. We don't have anything on graphite processing. Um, we could have that. I suppose that's the thing. Up until recently, I was thinking I was looking at these sites. Some of them are closing down, you know, places that no. could have made all the electrolyte solution. Uh, they're closing down places that could have made the separators. We could have we could have had a lot of the supply chain and we kind of we just we we botched it we lost it we didn't we, we the government wasn't fully in, kind of into it there are the energy prices were way too high and um, the environment wasn't right for these companies at that point and so everyone just looked and they said well if we're going somewhere we're going elsewhere and that's kind of what's happened up until now and the question is and the, you know does this does this Tartar investment change that and it's 
it's got a good chance of doing so. So that alongside um, AESC uh, and Nissan, it, it means we're no longer a laggard, potentially. We're, we're still catching up, but we're kind of no longer way, way behind. Um, yes. So that's, that's yes. encouraging, isn't it? Yes. W w would you say then that the light at the end of the tunnel isn't an oncoming train now? <laughs> yeah, potentially. Yeah, which is great, which is the first time we've been able to say that for, for, for some time. That being said, you know, if it, if it really did cost 500, uh, 500 million quid, you know, it's a lot of money. Uh, so let's see how much value for money comes out is. But then yeah. that's always been the way in practice. That's always been the way, you know, that well, well, got Nissan in and that involved lots of subsidies back then so yeah well, well and, and andy palmer who you probably know as well a mutual friend then it, it, he was very much part of that process of it that not going to spain but coming here right. and actually getting lord mandelson at the time involved in that and and yeah look i i don't flinch from us needing to spend public money to make these things happen because it is for the good of a country so whether it was 500 million or 800 million i suspect it'll be more than 500 million which is why they didn't announce it probably announced on Friday after the by-election. Um, but 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 I, I don't I don't want to be disingenuous to the government because they didn't they've done the right thing. They've helped a company, you know, make a decision to come here, which is only what we've seen writ large with the Inflation Reduction Act in America and only what China's been doing for the last decade. So, you know, I, I, there, there's nothing to be embarrassed about on it as to whether, you know, it could have been done earlier and cheaper. That's a whole other story. But let's kind of just move on um that's my sense of it but but look ed thank you so much for giving us so much more time i would typically make little 15 minute videos and put them on linkedin but we've done more than that so i'm going to make a couple and, and put them up okay. i really appreciate your time and i want thank to you. just re-emphasize that I, I i do love your book because it it brings to the attention the reality of this material world that we all live in and have lived in f forever without realizing it and I think in understanding it better, how you contextualize it and how you give people that sense of um, a real, big reality check is so important in, in encouraging people to, to, to go along in the right direction in terms of climate change and many other things. So, you know, personally, I'd just like to thank you very much for your endeavor. You've spent a lot of time and effort and toil doing this you haven't just sat in a room and bashed out a book in a few months you know th this no, has been this has been a mission <laughs> no it, i can clearly see this has been a tremendous mission so as and when the film comes um I, i'm there thank you very much great thanks roger no it's, it's really nice to know that um that's exactly what i wanted i wanted this book to be food for thought and hopefully be inspiring but also be be part of the explanation for for you know who we are as as, as a species really what a way to finish. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ed Conway.